Hi, this is Matt. This is the second of a series of videos covering Chapter 1 of Hurley's Concise Introduction to Logic. In the last video, we talked about some of the basic terminology when it comes to arguments, things like premises, conclusions, statements, and indicator words. In this video, we're going to dive a little bit more into detail of what makes an argument and how to recognize an argument. So in order for something to count as an argument in the first place, two conditions must be met. The first condition states that one, at least one of the statements, so remember arguments are composed of statements, at least one of those statements must present some kind of evidence or reasons. Sometimes this is called the factual claim. In order to be an argument, we've got to have some statements that, like here's the facts of the case, here's the evidence, here's the reasons, and these count as the premises. They are the things, the parts of the argument, that do the supporting. Now there also is a second condition that must be met. There has to be some kind of claim that the alleged evidence supports or implies something. Sometimes this is called the inferential claim. And so you can think about it this way. Premises are the evidence or the reasons, and the inferential claim, this second condition, is what the premises do. They support the conclusion. Okay, so that's the two conditions that must be met. You've got to have a factual claim, and you've got to have an inferential claim. These inferential claims can be either explicit or implicit. And whether or not they are explicit or implicit depends on whether or not indicator words are used. So this is why we need to know indicator words. If you see indicator words in an argument, things like therefore and for the reason that, those indicator words make the inferential claim explicit. And so think about explicit as something that's out there in your face. Back in the day, when people bought CDs, they had stickers on them that said explicit lyrics. And those explicit lyrics were there to be heard. The edited version of the same album, the language, the offensive language, was bleeped out. So it wasn't explicit. So when it comes to arguments, when you see those indicator words, that makes the inferential claim explicit, so you know what someone is doing. Sometimes, though, there won't be any indicator words, but there will be an argument. Someone will provide some evidence, and they'll say that evidence supports some conclusion, but they don't use any, any indicator words at all. In that case, the inferential claim is implicit, and implicit just means, you know, hidden, or you got to read between the lines. All right, so here's some examples. Here's an example of an argument. This argument has an explicit inferential claim because of the word thus there in the last sentence. Thus is a conclusion indicator, and since any argument that includes indicator words has an explicit inferential claim, this argument also has an explicit inferential claim. Now let's take a look at another one. In this one, there are no indicator words. Also, you notice in this one, or I'll go ahead and tell you, the conclusion is the first sentence of this argument. The genetic modification of food is risky business. And then we're given two reasons for that. It could introduce unintended changes into the DNA, and those changes can be toxic to the consumer. So this is an argument. The conclusion comes first. So that's something important to know. The conclusion can come anywhere in the argument, first sentence, last sentence, or anywhere in between. And this one contains no indicator word. So the inferential claim that those two statements support the conclusion that genetic modification of food is risky business is an implicit inferential claim. All right, now let's take a look at some arguments. And then we're going to talk about whether they are arguments or not and why. This sentence, whatever you do, never confide personal secrets to blabbermouth, Bob, is not an argument. We're given a suggestion or a command, but we're not given any reasons that back up this. So we have no inferential claim. This one doesn't count as an argument. How about this one? This also is not an argument. It's also just a suggestion. We're given some things that we should do when we go test drive a car, but we're not given any reasons why we should do any of these things. And because of that, no evidence to support these claims. We have no conclusion. All right, how about this one? This one looks kind of silly. Granny told me that pigs can fly. I know of a pig named Wilbur. It must be that Wilbur can fly. Well, even though this is silly, this one counts as an argument. We've got 
some evidence. Granny told me that all pigs can fly, and we've got a conclusion. It must be that Wilbur can fly. It counts as an argument because it meets both conditions. It's got the evidential claim in that first statement, and there is also an inferential claim that if you accept the fact that Granny is telling the truth, then you should also accept the conclusion. And that inferential claim is explicit. It must be that is an indicator word that indicates a conclusion. Wilbur can fly. How about this one? Not to honor men of worth will keep people from contention, and so on. This is not an argument. The problem with this one is it's just a loosely connected series of statements. There is no inferential claim that connects all of these together. So we don't meet that second condition of this. It's not an argument. All right, how about this one? Witnesses said they heard a loud crack. They tell you what happened. People fell. Broken glass. Investigators wait. are waiting. Blah, blah, blah. This one is a report of what happened, but it is not an argument. They are not trying to convince you of something using evidence and an inferential claim. All they're doing is telling you what happened. So this one doesn't count. Reports like this do not count as arguments. This one... If the moon is made of green cheese, then it's edible. The moon is made of green cheese, therefore it's edible, is an argument. It's not a very good argument, but it is an argument. It meets both of the conditions. It has an evidential claim. Those first two sentences, the moon's made of green cheese, then it's edible. The moon is made of green cheese. So those two are the evidence or the premises. And there's an inferential claim that you should accept the conclusion that the moon is edible. It's also an explicit inferential claim because we're using that word therefore. So this one meets all the conditions to be an argument. This one's a little tricky. This one is called an expository passage. There's three familiar states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. So that is the topic sentence of this expository passage. And then each sentence after that expounds on that expository passage. We're not trying to prove that there are three solid familiar states of matter. We're only trying to explain what we mean by the three states of matter. So this counts as an explanation and not an argument. Now, when it comes to explanations or expository passages, we need to know some of the details of the structure of an expository passage or an explanation because explanations and arguments are structurally similar. So I mentioned already that an expository passage is a kind of writing in which there's a topic sentence followed by more sentences that develop or explain the topic sentence. Unfortunately, what makes this tricky is sometimes expository passages can also attempt to prove the topic sentence, so they can sometimes be arguments. So this is what you need to know. Not all expository passages are arguments, okay? Only the ones that both explain the topic sentence and attempt to prove the topic sentence are arguments. If they don't try to prove anything, but they're just explaining, then they're expository passages alone, and they're not arguments. All right, let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. All right, here's an example of an explanation. Golf balls have a dimpled surface because dimples reduce air drag, causing the ball to travel farther. So this one is not an argument. And one way to see that it's not an argument is because we're not trying to prove that golf balls had dimpled surface. All we're doing is explaining why they have dimpled surface. I mean, just think about what kind of evidence someone would have to give you in order to prove that a golf ball has a dimpled surface. They're not going to tell you anything. They'll probably just hold up their hand with a golf ball in it and say, here, look, golf balls have dimpled surfaces. That's how we're going to prove it. So it's not the right kind of evidence to convince you that golf balls have dimpled surfaces. And a lot of times explanations are going to start from something that we already know to be true and then explain why. So there's lots of examples of this, of things that you know to be true, but you don't, you might not know why. For instance, here's another example. Manhole covers are round. Everybody knows that. If you've ever walked down the street and seen a manhole cover, you know that they're round. But do you know why they're round? So an explanation might be something like this. Well, given the geometry of a round manhole cover, when you pick it up and turn it on its end, no matter which way you turn it, it's not going to fall in the hole. Whereas if it was square, you could lift it up, turn it on its end, and then it can drop down into the hole at the diagonal because the diagonal is longer than any one of the sides of, of a square. So who wants to be working in a manhole and have the possibility of a manhole cover falling on your head? 
So that's one of the explanations for why a manhole covers a round. So we take something that we already know to be true, or the only way to prove it is to just show you that thing, and then we give you an explanation for why it is the case. All right, the two components, just like arguments have two components, the premises and the conclusion, explanations have two components as well. We're going to call these the explanandum and the explanands. So here's our definitions. The explanandums that describes the thing being explained, and the explanands is the thing that does the explaining. So in our examples, we use two examples. Golf balls have dimples because dimples reduce air drag. The explanandum in that case is that golf balls have dimples. That's the thing being explained. The explanands is that the dimples reduce air drag. It's the thing that does the explaining. All right, so here's the difference, once more, between an argument and an explanation. How do you know the difference? Well, one of the key differences between arguments and explanations is that arguments, at least the best kind of argument, the premises are facts that any reasonable person would, would accept. And then they try to prove a conclusion that's surprising or maybe something that you don't already believe or accept. Explanations, on the other hand, start from a thing that's also accepted as a fact. Usually that's the explanandum, though. And then the explanands attempts to explain or shed light on why those accepted facts are true, why it's the case. You can also think of it if, if you thought of the way premises are, are supposed to prove the conclusion. That's the inferential claim. Explanands aren't supposed to be proving the explanandum. Because, remember, with a golf ball, I'm just going to show you a golf ball to prove that it has dimples. Rather, explanands are attempting to explain or shed light on the explanandum. So that's the difference.